Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. I hope everyone is, is able to enjoy the peace that comes with Sabbath and that we will be able to join together in this study to look at different admonitions, different symbols, different things that are presented for our edification for this time in Earth's history. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his blessing and for his guidance as we open his word and the words of his prophet? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you, Father, for this opportunity to rest from the labors of this week, to rest from the cares of this world, to come before you with grateful hearts, thanking you for the many blessings that you have provided. Guide us now, direct us, so that as we open your word, we might be able to draw nearer to you. That we might be able to leave our cares at your feet so that we may enter into the joy of your salvation. Each of us, Father, has had experiences this week where we need your blessing. We need your forgiveness. And we need your guidance. Direct us now. Help us that we may be able to join together in spirit and in truth. May your angels be with us, each one. May your spirit guide this conversation. Please direct us now in all ways and in all things. For this, Father, we ask, we pray, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now. Does anyone remember what we were studying this last week? I mean, last last Sabbath morning. This last Sabbath morning, yes. We started looking at Joel. We began to look at Joel one because it is the last of the passages that Mrs. White had instructed that we should look at because we would see the condition of the world around us at the end of time. Now, before we come back into this portion of Joel, there was a small article that had come up in preparing for this, this study that led to some other things for our consideration. Now, this article from Youth Instructor, 26th of March, 1903, is quite short, but there are some other things that this article led to. So let us, let us consider carefully these few, these few paragraphs. Those who are saved in the kingdom of God will have nothing of which to boast. The praise and the glory will all belong to God, and to whom will it all be given? Sometimes young people who really desire to be the children of God are putting their trust in something beside the blood of Christ. They have faith in what they themselves can do. 
I have a great deal to do before I can come to Jesus, they say. When I've done all that I can do, then I will go to him for help. They think that when they have done what they can do to save their souls, Jesus will supply what is lacking, giving the finishing touches to their salvation. Now, does this describe righteousness by faith? As she continues, but no one can be strong in God until he acknowledges his helplessness and comes to Christ as the only one who can save him from the power of sin. In Egypt, the Israelites were required to sprinkle the lintels of their doors with the blood of a slain lamb. That when the angel of death went through the land, he might pass over their homes. But if instead of performing this simple act of faith, they had barricaded the doors, taking every precaution to keep the destroying angel out. Their efforts would have been in vain, for they would have testified to their unbelief. The blood on the lintel was enough. It secured the life of the firstborn. So it is today. It is the blood of Christ that cleanses from sin. Without this, all effort to gain salvation is in vain. It is the work of the sinner to accept Christ as his righteousness. Thus, he's reconciled to God. Only through faith in Christ can the heart be made holy. Many think that repentance is a work which men must carry forward themselves before they can come to Christ. They think that they have something to do before they can find Christ, a mediator in their behalf. It is true that there must be repentance before there is pardon, but the sinner must come to Christ before he can find repentance. It is the grace of Christ that strengthens and enlightens the soul, making repentance possible. Amen. Peter has made this matter clear. He says of Christ, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Repentance is as certainly the gift of Christ as is forgiveness. He whom God pardons the first he, he whom God pardons, he firsts makes penitent. Repentance cannot be found without Christ. From him comes the grace of contrition as well as the gift of pardon. Only through his atoning blood can either be obtained. Uh, brother? Yes. Uh, Elder, Elder Dwight? Um, Just brother. Okay, thank you. I just had that. It, my first impulse was to say brother, but um, those words are effective. Um, so can we uh, look at this and say that we actually have a sequence of operation there? That is possible because as the, as the sentence reads... He whom God pardons, he first makes penitent. So you must be penitent to be able to repent and to receive the gift of pardon. Well, that sounds like a list, uh, uh, like I just described. Um, that gives you... A sequence of order, of operation. Okay, but does that also not give you the first, second, and third angel's message? Exactly. Exactly. What was the name of this of this article that we're reading? Let's 
sorry, I never seen the name of the article. The article is entitled Repentance, a Gift of God. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Now, how often do we see repentance as being a gift of God? Um, it's more of a requirement uh, that we see it as. Well, how many times do we look, do we consider repentance being a gift? Um, again, um, as a human, we oftentimes require it before forgiveness. So, I mean, if there's a sequence of operation there, um, agreed. Forgiveness, forgiveness is something that you already have. You just need to exercise it uh, to fulfill all those other requirements. Actually, we don't have forgiveness before we have repentance. So there is a sequence of operation. Yes. I think we should, uh, did you send this particular thing out? No, it I'm hasn't gone out. It is, it's not gone out yet. I'm taking a screenshot, so I, I'm remembering where it was in this presentation. Thank okay. you very much. We will, th this will be sent out later. So please consider for a moment that repentance is a gift of God and pardon is a gift of God. We come to realize our great need of Christ, which allows us to become repentant. But in becoming repentant, we must lean upon him. Now, Repentance is as certainly the gift of Christ as is forgiveness. How many times do we see these as being gifts? Righteousness by faith is a gift of God. Yet many in the world and many within the church and the movement yet do not understand this. What was interesting to me as I, as I began to look through this was to come to understand different items that Mrs. White outlined as being gifts of God. If we apply this with a parable, what parables would we be able to apply as being in reference to gifts of God? Now, I realize that that is a very broad question. Where are we shown the gifts in parable form? The Beatitudes. Okay. Any other thoughts? What about the parable of the talents? Oh, that's that's a good one. Well, 
when we are looking at this in the light of the parable of the talents, how should we then proceed? Because if Christ, as he returns, is looking to see who has improved upon the talents that were given him, is this not also saying Christ is returning to see how we have made use of our gifts? That's our hope, right? I would hope so. So from the chat, comment was made. to look at Matthew 25, which again is the parable of the talents, but also the parable of the 10 virgins. Why do you think these two parables were presented in the book of Matthew right before his section on the final judgment? Order of operation. Okay. But is this also not a warning message for us today? Well, yes. Now, this entire article was nothing more than five chapters or five paragraph, excuse me. A very short discussion and expose on the gifts of God. Yet, if we were to look further in the spirit of prophecy, we would find the following. Some men have insight into matters, having ability to counsel. It is a gift of God that in moments when the cause of God is in need of words, sound and solemn and solid, they can speak words which will lead minds perplexed and in darkness to see as quick flash of sunlight the course for them to pursue. The answer to the question which has filled them with perplexity and baffled their minds in study for weeks and for months. There is an unraveling, a cleaning up of the path before them. And the Lord has let his sunlight in that they see their prayers are answered the way is made clear, but some rash advice may be given only to get out of Battle Creek. Notwithstanding, there is nothing clearly defined as to what improvement they will make in spiritual advancement for themselves or others in doing this. Letter 45, 1893, paragraph 11. Here we are being shown that the ability to counsel, to think clearly, to see the big picture is a gift of God. There will be times where we need to be able to consider carefully the words of others where we need to be able to listen and let God, through that still small voice, direct not only our steps, but our thoughts, our actions, and our speech. The human family is composed of responsible moral agents from the highest and the most gifted to the lowest and the most obscure. All are invested with the goods of heaven. Time is an entrusted gift of God and is to be diligently employed in the service of Christ. Influence is a gift of God and is to be exerted for the following of the highest noblest purposes. 
Christ died on Calvary's cross that all our influence might be used to lift him up before a perishing world. Those who behold the majesty of heaven dying on the cross for their transgressions will value their influence only as it draws men to Christ, and they will use it for this purpose only. Intellect is an entrusted talent. Sympathy and affection are talents to be sacredly guarded and improved, that we may render service to him whose purchased possession we are. Here again, there will be some with intellect. Many will have sympathy. Many will have great affections. All are talents. We are being charged, directed, and counseled that we are to improve upon the talents that the Lord has given us. We will be held accountable for our talents when Christ returns. We need to decide what are we willing to do? Are we willing to improve upon the talents because they have been graciously given? Or are we going to hide our talents and bury them? Because our Lord is such an exacting taskmaster. What attitude are we going to take? Oh, let it no longer be a source of grief to the heavenly intelligences and to him who has paid such an infinite price for souls that you refuse to be channels of light, that you refuse to cooperate with the heavenly agencies for the salvation of souls. But let us awake out of sleep and put all our God-given abilities into the work, that it may be written in the books that we are redeeming the time for the days are evil. Romans 13, 11, Ephesians 5, 16. If we keep our talents in, in action, we lose all the ability to make use of them. The mind is a gift of God designed to be improved and developed that we may be able to enlighten others but it may be perverted and misused in doing Satan's work. There are many people who struggle with many of the subjects that we have been studying over these last many months. Their attitude becomes, Jesus has already paid the price for my sin. All I have to do is believe on him. There's nothing else for me to do. These are just as surely keeping their talents in inaction and losing the ability to make use of their minds as are those that are deciding to make use of tobacco, of liquor, and of all things that drive a wedge between us and God. The mind is a gift from God designed to be improved and developed that we may enlighten others. How many times have we ever considered this? And as pointed out in the chat, and I thank you for this, this is being seen as a confirmation. If we do not guard the avenues of our mind, 
we can certainly be used by the adversary. Uh, brother? Yes. So we're, we're, I'm trying to follow along with you on the, on the print up there that I'm looking at. I don't see where you're at. You're, you're breaking up badly. It, it, where? I'm sorry. How's that? Is that any better? Much better. Okay, so I'm looking at the screen, and I don't, I don't see where you're reading from. Can you help me out here? Okay, what I just read was from the chat. No, prior to that, when you were when you were quoting, you know, uh, whatever it was that you were reading from, not the chats. Okay, right at at the last three or last two uh, sentences of this paragraph. Right below Romans thirteen eleven and Ephesians five sixteen, it states, "If we keep our talents in inaction, we lose all ability to make use of them." In what, bold, I don't see the paragraph. Really, uh, what what paragraph is it? Number two, three, four, because that's what I'm looking at. Five. Okay, I'm I'm currently looking at. Is this not being shared? Let's see. This is what I'm thinking. That's why I made this statement. Okay. Do we not see, oh, let it let it no longer be a source of grief? No, uh, so so what I'm reshare. looking at is... Reshare. What's that? You have to reshare. Is that sharing? Nope. Okay. My apology. No worries, bro. Okay, so that one shared. We be moving now. Okay, just a moment. Bear with me, please. Okay. Now, can you see this giving a reference from Romans 13, 11 and Ephesians yes. 5? Okay. So this was taken from manuscript 13, 1895, paragraph 9. That the mind is a gift of God designed to be improved and developed that we may be able to enlighten others. Here again we have a admonition on one side where we may be of service to the savior and a warning on the other where the mind may be perverted and misused in doing the adversary's work. Now from manuscript 53 of 1895, Children are a gift of God to increase the experience and the happiness of parents. Parents through discipline may become more useful in teaching their children to be Christ's children and so increase their influence for good. Now, the last paragraph that I was led to choose for this was a non-published document Manuscript 34 of 1896. This was a letter that Mrs. White wrote to her son, Willie. The speaker addressed my son, W.C. White, as a laborer together with God. He addressed May as one who was standing under great responsibilities. He said, 
you must be steadfast in the faith once delivered to the saints. You will find it a very pleasant life to walk with Jesus. But there is danger in becoming careless, deficient in piety and devotion. You have new responsibilities, and these precious children are the gift of God. Study your Bible in faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You need to draw nigh unto God. As parents, humble yourself before him and ask most sincerely for an understanding heart to know and believe and obey every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God as revealed to you in his word. Faith does not originate with yourselves nor proceed from yourselves. It is a gift of God. You must both consider and move in your family as united wise teachers, always acting from principle, never from impulse. Faith, <clears throat> the mind. Repentance. Thank you for the rebuke, brother. No, I'm not well rebuking. Taken. No, 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 no. I heard it. Um, it was for me. <laughs> no, not you didn't. You didn't plan this. He did. I heard it. In and through this, as I have said many times, I choose to point no fingers. Because as I point one at others, I have three pointed at myself. And, and so that's my comment is I heard it. It's, it's, I feel it. It's, it was directed at me. I understand it. It might have been directed at other people, but I took it as a full-on direction and a rebuke to me. Okay. Today, we need to come to understand that faith repentance, and ever so many other things are gifts of God. They are the talents that need to be improved upon so that we may have a clearer understanding of the warnings that have been given for our admonition by those prophets that lived in time before. There are not many things that Mrs. White notes as being gifts of God. But in all of these gifts, we have them so that we may truly grow to become the children that Christ would have us to become. Now, as we return to this study in the book of Joel, we're going to reread a couple of verses, and then we are going to go forward, because there is much yet to unpack here. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, howl, O ye vine dressers. For the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up and the fig tree languisheth. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. When Christ ceases his intercession in the sanctuary, the unmingled wrath threatened against those who worship the beast and his image will re and receive his mark, Revelation 14, 9 and 10, will be poured out. Are you sharing? Yeah, thank you. So, new share, I thought I was. No changes in the screen. There it is. It's there now? Roger that. Now,
when Christ ceases his intercession in the sanctuary, then the unmingled wrath is going to be poured out. Have we seen the wrath of God being poured out upon the world now? Sort of. I mean, it's not the full on wrath, but it's getting there. Okay. Now I'm <clears throat> I'm going to take a step backwards for a moment because of a question that's being asked in the chat. If we repent of sin and afterwards we do that very sin often as other times, does it mean that God has not yet given us his gift of repentance? Or does it mean otherwise, being that we are the one's problems to ourselves? <clears throat> How often in our lives do we look to repent of sin and then find ourselves again involved in that same sin that we hate so much well it's part of the human nature faith is a gift of god repentance <clears throat> is a gift of god if we return to sin are we not then choosing to set aside the gift that is given? Um, if I got it understood correctly, um, our efforts are, are only um, able to be manifested with a co-worker. And that co-worker is Christ. And if we're still going back into the sin, then we're really not operating um, with our coworker. And that's where I think we oftentimes mess up is that we think we've got it, but you know, we're, we're really not because we're ignoring the coworker. Did I completely confuse everybody. Okay. <clears throat> the, answer your, the answer to your question, Dwight, is the answer yes. Okay. When we <clears throat> when we are addressing the message that we are to give. Do we not have to have accepted that message in our lives first? Yes. Does that then not mean that we are to be allowing Christ to have full control in our lives before we can give a message to others? Yes, that's right. I'm thinking that you're correct. Okay. Now, verses were quoted in the chat. James 1, 12 to 15. Why is this important? It's about resisting temptation. It says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. 
So I think the key is to be constantly relying on Christ and asking him for the strength to endure, to resist the temptation, no matter Every how often it comes to us. Repeat, please. Every word, I mean, every breath should be a prayer. Okay. That's the aim. Okay. To whom are we to look for our salvation? There's no other but Jesus. So, if we are looking for our salvation... Are we to look to ourselves for that salvation? No, sir. If we are looking to ourselves for that salvation, who are we actually looking toward? Uh, we're looking at a mirror. There's only two choices here. Either we are looking to Christ for salvation or we are looking to the adversary for salvation. Yeah, well, my point was, is uh, you were looking at yourself. You weren't looking at Christ as being that reflection of character. <clears throat> to repeat the, the portion that I had read. When Christ ceases his intercession in the sanctuary, the unmingled wrath threatened against those who worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. Revelation 14, 9 and 10 will be poured out. The plagues upon Egypt when God was about to deliver Israel were similar in character to those more terrible and extensive judgments, which are to fall upon the world just before the final deliverance of God's people. Says the revelator in describing these terrible scourges, there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. The sea became as the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea and the rivers and the fountains and waters became blood. Revelation 16, 2 to 6, 8 and 9. Terrible as these inflictions are, God's justice stands fully vindicated. The angel of God declares, Thou art righteous, O Lord, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. By condemning the people of God to death, they have as truly incurred the guilt of their blood as if they had been shed by their hands. In like manner, Christ declared <clears throat> the Jews of his time guilty of all the blood of holy men, which had been shed since the days of Abel, for they possessed the same spirit and were seeking to do the same work with these murderers of the prophets. That is a paragraph that is heavy with implications for us to consider. In the plague that follows, power is given to the sun to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat. The prophets thus describe the condition of the earth at this fearful time. The land mourneth because the harvest of the field is perished. All of the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. The seed is rotten under their clods. The garners are laid desolate. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. The rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. The songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. Joel 1, 10 through 12 and 17 to 20. 
Amos 8.3. <clears throat> These plagues are not universal, or the inhabitants of the earth will be wholly cut off. Yet they will be most the most awful scourges that have ever been known to mortals. All the judgments upon men prior to the close of probation have been mingled with mercy. The pleading blood of Christ has shielded the sinner from receiving the full measure of his guilt. But in the final judgment, wrath is poured out unmixed with mercy. Consider carefully the warning that was given on July 18th. This warning <clears throat> was very much mingled with mercy. It is not unlike the warning that was given to those in Nineveh that created such an issue for the prophet Jonah. Right now, we are seeing that there has been mercy granted with the warning given to Nashville. There have been mockers, those that were with us that are with us no longer, that are choosing to doubt this message. <clears throat> they are choosing to doubt that God had given this message. Yet, where did the message come from? Where do we find it original? And at what time was this given? Was it not given by Ellen Gould Harmon White? Was this not presented in 1905? And would we agree that she is as much a prophet as Joel, as Isaiah, and as Daniel? So if a message is given by a prophet, <clears throat> if it is presented in God's order, is that message not important for us at this day? In that day, multitudes will desire the shelter of God's mercy, which they have so long despised. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. Amos 8, 11 and 12. As it is pointed out again in the chat, God's delays are not denials. Habakkuk 2.3 is given as a reference. We speak often of the charts. We speak often of the warnings that God has given. Yet how often are we accepting these warnings and taking these warnings to heart? Are we going to be like those in the day when God's wrath is poured out without mercy, that we are going to desire the shelter of his mercy? Do we despise it now? 
where do we stand? Joel 1.13, gird yourself and lament, ye priests, howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. What are we told to do here? When someone gives you a gift, do you accept that gift or do you reject that gift? Well, it's a good manners would be to accept the gift. Yet how few are willing to accept the gift of true repentance? Well, um, if, if, if what our eyes tell us this has anything to do with it, uh, I would say that um, um, we're sadly lacking the accept acceptance thing. When we accept truly our need of repentance, we are willing to let that burden of sin that we have carried for so very long to go. There's a work in us, this work of repentance, that has needed to be done in each one of us so that we may more clearly and directly proclaim the word of God. Amen. Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Or as would be said in the alternate, sanctify a fast, call a day of restraint, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. <clears throat> Is there a time in the history of the Bible that we can point directly with that typifies Joel 114. Now, if we reverse that, what is. Yeah, I just was noting that right now. Okay, what is 411? Information, brother. What information then can we take from this verse? What example are we given within scripture? Does anyone have a thought? So please ask your question again. Well, is it is it is it isn't it a cry that's made? The cry would be the midnight cry, wouldn't it? Well, the midnight cry is part of this, brother. Uh there's something more direct that, that I'm seeing, and I just I'm asking the question to see if I'm off base. Again, is, my my question okay. is, what, what was your question? We are given this example in Joel. <clears throat> Where do we find the book of Joel? Is this not in the Old Testament? Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes it is. <clears throat> is this a 
chapter that was written prior to the advent of Christ? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Is there an example in the Bible where we find a solemn assembly, a gathering of the elders and inhabitants into the house of the Lord and where they cried unto the Lord? Well, you had two or three examples. You have the one with um, Solomon and you have uh, one with um, I think I, 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 A, I can't I, <laughs> what's his name? I'm sorry. No, you're fine. It's one in Kings. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> does this verse typify the upper room experience? Yes. Uh, yeah, um, now that Definitely. you mention it. Is this information helpful for us to understand the time in which we are living and the duty that is before us? Well, it's definitely an aid. Jehoshaphat was one of them kings that made a fast. Of course. Are we to fast from the word of God? Negative. Are we to have a day of restraint where we are willing to set aside our preconceived ideas and listen to our brothers and sisters so that we may come into a clearer understanding of what God is trying to tell us at this time. Um, very good observation, uh, Brother Dwight. Now, <clears throat> as is pointed out in the chat, From Acts verses, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where also abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotus and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, we're being called to this experience. The if symbology we of, the, of, of that statement that you just had had Christ relatives in it. Right. It says a lot. If we're being called to this experience, is this calling not preparing us so that we may be prepared to give a message? to this world and give a message so direct and so clear that it makes ears tingle. So can we equate that into um, divesting of ourselves, of our character, and adopting the character of Christ? Is there a 
Is <clears throat> that it? We have to be willing, as we will see when we get into the book of Zechariah, for our garments, our character to be removed and for it then to be replaced with the character of Christ. We have to be willing to accept the gift of Christ's character. Amen, bro. Now, part of the problem, you know, that we have in, in trying to experience this is simply we've heard these things a million times. And right. so, so they start to become meaningless. That is, um, because they're, they're very good illustrations, you know, that we have in scripture and the spirit of prophecy and that other people have used to describe the conversion process. But, you, you know, James and John, uh, you know, wanted to have a place, you know, a special place with Christ. Right. They have to take up their cross daily and follow. Like the character of Christ is not, it's not, I mean, it, it's represented as garments. And we realize that our, our character has to be replaced, right? That is, there is not something in our character that is, you know, just mixed with God's character. That is, there's not in the in the garment of Christ's righteousness, there's the righteousness. There's not one thread of human devising. That is, we don't have anything to offer God. We have nothing worthy to offer God. Yes. Right. Yeah. So I mean, when we give him what we have, it is it is valueless. But it's the giving of it to God that that God values. It's like a child who, you know, just just an example that comes to mind, but, you know, uh, goes to the store to buy something with uh, uh, a rock and three buttons. Right. You know, that's the exchange that that would be somewhat analogous to us giving our heart to Christ and him giving us his life, his righteousness. But, you know, we imagine that we have something to offer to God. But, but we don't. Right? We don't have anything to offer him. You know, other than to give up everything that we are, which is nothing, so that we can have everything which he is. And it only comes from obedience, though. Well... But it's not our obedience that somehow earns that this happens. I mean, if we have a transformation. That's a result of it, evidently, from what uh, right. other Dwight has been saying. Right. So that, that would become a, a result of those actions. Right. So we have a transformation of character. We end up hating the things we once loved and loving the things we once once hated. But that requires a cross. And, and people sometimes misunderstand the cross in the sense of, you know, that that's, that's sort of like works. Like if we have to take up our cross, you know, they, they translate that in it's, you know, we have to work our way to heaven. Um, but in taking up our cross, that don't work. that's death to self. That's where there is no works in a cross. Right? It, the old man dies. Everything that we were is gone as far as righteousness is concerned, because we had none. All of our righteousness was filthy rags. And what we're receiving is Christ's righteousness. But, but there is a lot of confusion on that, because we do talk about works, because we know that faith, with, faith without works is dead. Right. In order to understand this, I need to understand that, that Paul and James no, that's the, that's the dog are talking that about the same thing. So when Paul and James are talking, they're talking about the same thing. They're not talking, they're not in, at odds with each other. 
You you said something, Ron? Oh, I'm sorry. I my, I didn't have my mute on. Uh, okay. I got a barking dog across from me, and it was my wife was addressing it. Okay. Now, from the chat, <clears throat> the comment is made that it, it is a coming together without an agenda. Yes. Did the disciples and those that met in the upper room after the ascension of Christ have an agenda at that time? Um. Well, is this a trick question? Because it, apparently it, it was the agenda was unity. Well, I think the agenda was was not so much unity. It was to to recognize that their disappointment had, in a sense, broken their ambition and. Unity was the result, but I don't think that that's necessarily what they were doing in the upper room. They were trying to sort through what this all meant. But you know, unity I agree. resulted. Okay, in sorting through what this all meant, did they not come into covenant with each other? Yeah, because they saw themselves as they really were. The unity was a result of that investigation. Okay. On October 23rd, 1844, did that begin an examination within the hearts of many of the Millerites? Some. How um, many? Well, at the end, I think it was 50, wasn't it? Okay. And of those 50, there were those that came to understand that you cannot come into covenant relationship without understanding the very transcript of the character of God. When we look at the 1843 chart, the law of God and the sanctuary are two items that are not front and center on that chart. The Millerites. No, there's but, Christ is the front and center. Okay. The Millerites were being led to come into covenant, but they had not come into covenant because they did not fully understand what the covenant was. Uh, are you implying that it was a corner? It was not the, their focus. Their focus was in that corner at that moment and then it turned to Christ? No, I'm not. I'm not implying that it was a corner at all. I'm representing that they had portions of this that had been placed before them but they did not have a full understanding of what the requirements were that's because the, the they hadn't passed that way mark yet right I mean, they okay i get it Are we not in the same situation as were the Millerites on October 23, 1844? Question again, please. Are we not in the same situation as were the Millerites? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. We need to accept the gifts that God has given. We need less of self and more of Christ 
but better still, we need none of self and all of Christ. Amen. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Will the destruction come from the Almighty regardless of what we do? Is this going to happen? Yes. Is destruction going to fall upon Nashville? Yes. It's my sincere belief. Is destruction going to fall upon Nashville before the wrath of God falls on the earth or after the wrath of God falls upon the earth? I think, I don't know. It might be the example, uh, I think, before. What do the rest say? Before or after? What are your thoughts? Before. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, um, I'm sorry. I was looking at my um, <laughs> my laptop. I mean, my um, phone instead of my laptop, and I couldn't actually see that. Thank you so much for making me look at my big screen. Okay. Anyone else? Is this going, is destruction going to come on Nashville before the wrath of God is poured out or after? I'm with Rosanna. Definitely uh, before. Before. All right. I'm in agreement with you. It's going to happen before because it is going to be one of those way marks that are going to be able to be used to show that this, that the wrath of God is soon to be poured out. And that now is the time of salvation, not when the judgments without mercy are happening. So um, an observation of the, of the message that was given about Nashville Um if this was after, right? Right. Um, what What would, why would they even um, be asking us, well, you didn't tell us it was coming. You know, why didn't you tell us it was coming? Um, they can't say that for sure because we told them. <laughs> um, and um, it wouldn't be relevant after. It would okay, be so, relevant before. No, so we told them, but that's not who they're asking. They're not asking us. They're asking the Seventh-day Adventists. That right. They, okay. So the Seventh-day Adventists that they know knew it was coming, but didn't warn them. That It's no reference to them asking us. I'm how, sorry. We're, how we're, terrible will it be in that okay. day to have been a member of a church that had a warning, <clears throat> that had a specific word of warning to present, and yet they didn't wish to present the warning because they might look foolish. So I, I talked with a friend the other day that we actually um, kind of, this subject, came up in the conversation and it wasn't me that brought it up it was him and um he knows my affiliations with the ffa and um he says yeah that was a real embarrassment now wasn't it okay uh, just to confirm your statement right now <clears throat> the translators had used the following verses to support what they're saying Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. <clears throat> Jacob 
shall be saved out of this time of trouble. Those that have their reliance upon God shall be saved from this time of trouble. Isaiah 13, 6. How will ye, <clears throat> how will ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and with fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Joel 2.1 Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Why is the trumpet blown? Well, it's to get their attention. Is it not for a day of worship or to warn of the approach of an enemy? To warn of the approach of an enemy. So we are told to blow this trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. An alarm has been being sounded to the Seventh-day Adventist church that we're asleep. What is the, the parable of the ten virgins? Only half of the virgins were asleep? No, the, the, the call, awake, 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 was to all of them. All have been asleep. Yet we are refusing this warning from Joel. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. The warning, the message that destruction is soon to fall has indeed been given. The church has not wanted the message given because it was embarrassed by Mrs. White. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Does that not mean that this warning is to go out completely and totally through the Adventist church, that all of the members are to be warned. You're asking the question? Yes. Yes, I am asking that question. Yes. Is my answer. When we compare this with Ezekiel 9, where is the warning to be given? Where do we begin? Uh, the house of God. When we compare this with 1 Samuel 3, who is giving the warning? Uh, um, it's Samuel um, to Eli. And what does this typify? Um, this typifies uh, listening to that wee little voice that um, we don't uh, often, we, we, we actually get out of the habit of listening to, which is what Eli's uh, problem was. And uh, he wasn't able to hear the call, but Samuel did. And so he went three times, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, he went three times uh, to Eli and told him or asked him, what did you want? I heard you call me. And he's like, I'm not, I didn't, I didn't tell you to call. I didn't call you go back to sleep. So is that a key? Go back to sleep. And so three times he does this. And on the third time he perceived that, um, that it was the Lord speaking to him. And then he told him, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I could be, uh, you have to correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, he told him that, uh, you're done, bro. Uh, that's just shortening it up. Uh, and it's going to do it like this and like that. And then, um, 
and then that stuff happened. And Samuel was the being uh, seen as that uh, voice uh, that was replacing Eli. It was a progressive, it was a progressive event. Um, started at the very beginning and slowly worked its way till Phineas and the other um, took the cart out, right? I mean, took the ark out and and poor old Eli uh, dumped over onto the, the ground and broke his neck. What does Eli represent today? Well, that would be the Adventist church. That's a little broad. Well, um, the leadership in the Adventist church. And that's even a bit broad. So let's refine this a bit. Help, help me out. Does Eli today represent the leadership that are trained in spiritual formation? They are it trained seems to me that the whole the whole organization uh, is Eli because they keep going. Hey, go back to sleep. Go back to sleep. But when he comes again, they're like, go back to sleep. Go back to sleep. Okay. I mean, uh, I'm starting to see things, but do you see that? In this situation, as we apply the parable of the ten virgins, we accept that all were asleep. When we're digging into this, especially out of the book of Joel, a warning has been given, and there are those that do not wish to accept the warning because, hey, this could embarrass us. This could create a problem for us within the World Council of Churches. This could create a problem for us with our other brothers in Christ. The leadership has its issues. Would it, would it be the priest Dwight? Yes. Would it be the priest what, brother? Would it be the priest that represents Eli? In a way, Lee, Eli is representing definitely the leadership of the, of, of the church, but it is representing a leadership that is trained according to man's way versus God's way. Does that make sense? Yes. If Eli's representing those that are trained in God's way versus, or excuse me, man's way versus God's way, how is Samuel being trained? Could we say that Samuel is being trained according to Miller's rules? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Um, I, I don't. I don't mean to interrupt. Yes, I do. Go ahead. Can we address? Let me address this at the end. But please remind me. Okay. Our situation right now. We are in a school of training. In a way of looking at it, we are in a type of a boot camp. We are being prepared for the battle, the message that needs to be given first to the leadership to the old men before the house of God and then to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That's the way it's looking, brother. Dwight, I, I, I think I've been in the battle ever since I've been a seven-day Adventist. So I don't know. <laughs> I can understand. 
Believe lots me. of training, brother. Lots of training for the big one. There's a lot that we need to have driven out from our characters. Some of those items have been inherited. Some of those items have been of choice. When this warning is going out, it is a warning that we need to wake up and listen to. It is a warning that many wish not to hear. And for them, it is always, go back to sleep. Everything is going to be fine. I have been trained to be able to tell you what the Bible says. You don't need to listen to all of these things that are coming from Miller's rules. You don't need to listen to those that are stirring things up. Go back to sleep. So um, could that be related to the, uh, the dog stuff, the comments about the dogs turning on their own vomit, blah, 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 blah. Um, as far no. as no uh, the character or anything? No, the, the, the situation with the dog returning to its own vomit is a situation that I think we're being shown the way in which we have been treating the gifts of God. We would rather take that that has come from us, from man, than we would to take that which has come from God. Amen, brother. Now, we are coming close to the end of our time today. What other comments or questions do we have from what we have covered? Do we understand the gifts that God has presented for us? Gifts that we can choose to accept or gifts that we can heartlessly reject? Are we willing at this point to accept the gifts that God has given and choose to improve upon these gifts, which are the talents that God has allowed us to have? What choices are we going to make today? Not the ones that we made yesterday, I hope. Uh, that's metaphoric, metaphoric. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments? You know, it's, I'm lightning, bro. It, it went from me and it hasn't come back, but I probably will. And I'll text you on it. All right. Any other concerns with things that we need to address today? Um, I'm sorry. I, I didn't look at the, uh, who, who's who's having churches at the Merrick group this morning? It's the American group and Collins presenting. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay. Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven. We are blessed with life we are blessed with the gifts that you provide we are blessed from the tests that you place upon us we are blessed with the answers to prayer we are blessed by your very presence in all things help us today to consider that which you would have us to understand. Direct us in the path in which we walk. Show us that which we should do.
direct us now so that we may gladly accept the gift of your character, the gift of faith, the gift of repentance, so that we may be able to understand what it means to worship you in spirit and in truth. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen.